Welcome to AWA's first virtual pre-1912 wireless and electrical show and tell at AWA's first virtual 2020 conference. For this show and tell, we picked out one of our newer acquisitions. Jim picked this up last year from an auction from a basement cabinet of a physics lab of Holyoke University's college. Holyoke University College was a woman's college. And so it was pretty interesting to find a piece that was actually used for demonstration back around 1900 to 1906 when wireless was at cutting edge. This piece was manufactured by Ziegler Electric Company out of Boston, Massachusetts. And Holyoke College was also in Massachusetts. These, this wire would have been to either antenna or ground. The same here. And it's a coherer receiver. As you can see, the coherer consisted of metal filings, and you can actually see the metal filings in the tube. When a signal came through, the metal filings would come together or cohere, and then the tapper would loosen them back up again and prepare them for the next signal. The signal would be heard by the sounder, and these would be attached to either an indicator or a printing telegraph register or a bell which would help the students to understand the, how wireless was working. There was a relay here that was used to relay the signal. These were attached to batteries and it was a great representation, all original. The wiring hasn't been changed, nothing was messed with a great representation of a piece that was used to teach women about wireless before they could even vote. And in time, early 1900s, and a very complete and early representation. The next item for our show and tell is a FB Chambers spark key. You can tell that it's a spark key by the heavy contacts. And this is an example of a spark key that may have been actually manufactured pre-1912 because there is an example in catalog, in a 1911 catalog for FB Chambers of the same key. They're very proud of this key. They call it our wireless key. And as the catalog describes it, they say it's especially good where heavy currents are to be broken. It is heavily constructed, being made of solid brass, and all metal parts are nickel plated, and you can see the nickel plating. You will notice there is no spiral spring to raise the lever, that being done by a curved spring. There is a curve on this spring, which causes the lever to work more freely than is usually the case with wireless keys. This key has been said to have by wireless experts who have tried any number of different keys the easiest touch of any key on the market. The points are of an alloy that will not stick and cause very little sparking. Keys are finished with hard rubber knob and are mounted on Italian marble bases. These keys will hold handle up to a kilowatt transformer, but for 50 cents more you get a heavy duty and for another 50 cents more, going starting from $6.50 to $7 to $7.50, you can get 
even heavier contacts. We think this might be the heaviest one, and that would handle a 3 to 5 kilowatt transformer. You can see the, bot, the base has the original waxing and hasn't been touched. The nameplate shows the 1914 move that they would made and it does have a really nice feel to it. It's about four pounds it's a nice heavy. The marble base really helps an operator to have that stability. And FB Chambers was featured in last year's article. You can tell a little bit about the company and the Hester and Frank, who were a couple that founded FB Chambers and from 1904, around the time when wireless was early in Philadelphia, they were one of the best, better manufacturers, smaller, obvious, than Atwater Kent and, and Philco eventually, but they were, of that, that day, a very solid wireless company in Philadelphia. We have an example of some early catalogs. This catalog was from 1911. If you look inside, it was easy to date because there was a discount sheet that was dated and doesn't always happen with catalogs, but in this case, we we're fortunate to have that. It also this is the 1913 catalog, the last one they did when they were on at North 9th Street. And then from there they moved to the Arch Street residence where they, in 1914, were able to display and sell. And you can see there's an example of the key in each of these catalogs. And this is a supplement to this specific catalog. So we've been collecting catalogs for a long time and we're very fortunate to be able to find these excellent examples to go along with a beautiful example of an early spark key and with a special design on a marble base. The next item for our show and tell is an original newspaper that was printed on board ship in 1899. It was re through messages that were received by wireless and Marconi's signature is on the top of this newspaper because he was on board ship while they were receiving and printing the newspaper. It happened on November 15, 1899. St. Paul of the American Line on the passage from New York to Southampton with Marconi and his apparatus on board picked up a series of brief messages sent out by the Needles Wireless Station, which was in England and 60 to 70 miles distant. Greetings between ship and shore were followed by some short news articles. They were received on Marconi instruments that had been used in reporting the American Cup races and were embodied in a single printed sheet to which the title the Transatlantic Times was given. Copies were sold on board at a dollar each in aid of the Seamen's Fund. This is the first time that such a venture had been undertaken. A newspaper published at sea with wireless telegraph messages 
received and printed on a ship going 20 knots an hour. The next time that we have an example is a newspaper that was actually printed on an island, Catalina Island, from messages that were received from San Pedro, California. And this actually was in 1903. They started Catalina Island actually began in March 25th with their first newspaper and continued for quite some time. Rhode Island, which was Black Island, also in 1903 began publishing their edition from Point Judith to Black Island and they were they started in July 9th they actually the first uh, edition had an article about how to forest had gotten trying to plant a ground plate and while doing that was pushed out to sea and managed to still plant the plate and swim to shore. And then they said as soon as he dried out at the station, he headed home to New York. But Black Island Wireless was printed by the Providence Journal Company and was equipped with the DeForest system. They talked about their first newspaper, where they, that the news was hurled through the air. So everyone was pretty proud of being able to, in 1903, get the local news very quickly. And going full circle, Marconi system was on board and there were bulletins that were also being transmitted from shore to ship so that the passengers could get the local news and purchase newspapers for souvenirs which these happen to be souvenirs from someone's purchase back in 1903. We were also fortunate to purchase a full run of the Block Island wireless newspapers from 1903 that although these are only copies it is still neat to see all the information and to get a feel for that time period when people just didn't get news as quickly as we do and now you it's instant but in those days this was the way, and, and people were proud of the fact that they could get information through these type of medias using wireless, which was in its infancy and in 1903. Our next item is a detector. Now this early and primitive item looks like it was patterned after Marconi's cigar box magnetic detector. As you can see, the construction is very similar to the construction that Marconi had in 1902. We assume this is probably somewhere between 1902 and 1905. We also have an example of a magnetic detector that was featured in electrician and mechanic and it is more like the magnetic detector that was commercially done by Marconi. The Marconi magnetic detector consisted of an endless iron band 
this was built of 70 strands of number 40 gauge silk covered iron wire. In operation, the band passes over two grooved pulleys that are rotated by a wind up clockwork motor. And you can see it in action. The iron band passes through the center of a glass tube, which is wound with a single layer along several millimeters with number 36 gauge silk covered copper wire. This coil functions as the primary or the RF frequency coil. Over this winding is a small bobbin wound with wire of the same gauge to a resistance of about 140 ohms. This coil functions as the secondary or the audio pickup coil. Round these coils, two permanent horseshoe magnets are arranged to magnetize the iron band as it passes through the glass tube. The results in a short tone or a dot or a longer tone or a dash, which could be heard through headphones that would be connected here and then the antenna would be here and earth, the British term for ground, would be here. This was the same model as what was used on the Titanic and was used actually from 1903 through 1912 commercially and actually also used up to 1918. And if you are listening for dots and dashes, you might have a smile on your face, like Bonzo here. You never know what you're going to find on eBay. Jim's jaw dropped when he saw this picture for auction. And when he saw the construction and realized it was a magnetic detector. He was pretty nervous for a little while while he was waiting to bid on it, but he managed to get it for less than $300. It was advertised as an amateur radio homemade vintage type wireless device. So it's always good to keep your eye out because you never know what you might find. And we were happy to add this to our collection back in 1909, 2009. And I'm sure Bonzo, Jim was smiling like this when it arrived. And Bonzo, if he'd heard dots and dashes coming through there, would be pretty happy about it too. Our next item is an early page walking beam style electric motor circa 1840. The reciprocating electromagnetic engine was invented by Charles Page and was first described in Benjamin Silliman's American Journal of Science, volume 35, Magnetoelectric and Electromagnetic Apparatus and experiments by Charles Page. As he described it in 1838, in this instrument contrived by Dr. Page, two horseshoe electromagnets are firmly secured in a vertical position, the four poles appearing just above a small wooden table. And you can see them there, the four poles of the magnet just above this small wooden table. The two armatures connected by a brass bar move upon a horizontal axis in such a manner that while one is approaching, 
the poles of the magnet over which it is placed, the other is receding from those of the other magnet. The brass bar is connected with one extremity of a horizontal beam, the other end of which communicates motion by means of a crank to a flywheel. On the axis of the flywheel is the brake piece. And the brake piece you can see as it comes around, it's a little shiny on the end. And it makes contact with each of these points. Each magnet being charged in succession, the armatures are attracted alternately, communicating a rapid reciprocating motion to the beam and consequently a rotary one to the flywheel. A prototype of this apparatus made by Davis in July 1838 was used to power a drill used to drill the steel plates for gas burners. Page claimed that this was the first example of the mechanical application of electromagnetism. We wanted to see if it would fire up and applied 12 volts and the motor was actually working but we saw some sparking right here and we were worried that it might draw too much current and we're afraid we'd do damage and so we are not going to fire it up but you can see how it would how it was working One of the neat things about this item that was found in, New in an attic in New York City is on the bottom, it was given to Wallace Crabbe by his granddad, George Crabbe, in 1927. And you can see the hand fashion nuts and the way everything is original. The soldering, incredible original condition. One of these motors can be seen in some of the museums, but it is very, very rare. And to see it in this type of condition is extremely rare. We were able to find an example in Davis's Manual of Magnetism. This edition was from 1842 and it says with a hundred original illustrations, one of which of the illustrations can be seen on page 112, Pages Reciprocating Engine. And it is quite similar there are a few minor differences, but you can see that it is very similar to the actual item that we have. The next items are Balschbaden or dance cards. These dance cards were special editions and souvenirs from a time when Strauss waltzes and social balls were the high point of the year. The dance card, no matter when it was made, generally consisted of a decorative case which opened to reveal a book that listed the various dance titles and composers with a blank line which would be filled in with the name of the person with whom the lady intended to dance. Listed in the card could be from 10 or up to 20 or more dance titles. The case included a pencil with which to write a name. A decorative cord was attached to the case so that it could be hooked to the lady's ball gown. Generally, the case that holds the card reflects the sponsor of the ball with some object depicted in miniature 
especially seen with European dance cards. The sponsoring organization would have the committee meet with the Balschbaden manufacturer to decide on the design to be used for the dance card. These unique dance cards provided miniature examples of the occupation that the balls represented, such as doctors, mechanics, electricians, telegraph operators, engineers, and railroad brokers. They were manufactured in small quantities for each ball, dating from about 1850 to 1925, and are thought to originate in and around Vienna, Austria, and included Bohemian cities as well, such as Budapest and Prague. Many companies or organizations were proud to sponsor a ball and display an intricate miniature for the ball. The admission fee to Viennese balls was higher for women than for men to cover the cost of the Ballschwaden. For some reason, probably social custom, the Hungarian and American dance cards list the sponsors not only by their organization name, but also by the members' names. Today, dance cards or Ballschwaden are a rarity. They are fragile, may not have survived the wars. There, these are a few great examples we have been fortunate to find over many years of collecting. The first one that I'm going to show you actually moves and it's an electric repulsion motor but it is missing the dance card unfortunately and the pencil. But a beautiful example of the occupation that sponsored the ball. Our next example is an induction coil with hand electrodes from a psychiatrist ball. Now if anybody knows about these coils, they're used for quack medical purposes and people thought that they would cure any ailment by getting an electric shock. This is a great example of a dance card and you can see the pencil and you can see inside the different names of the dances and actually where a name of a person that was going to dance, a dance partner, was listed. This one has only a few dances and because this is from Budapest, there's actually the members and, and sponsors that are listed. Great example of a special ball from a psychiatrist company. This was from 1891 and is actually if you look carefully, Siemens in Halsk, Vienna is listed. And that was very early example of a meter. And they even had a special tassels for the woman to, to make it a little bit fancier as she attached it to her ball, to her ball gown. This one is one of my favorites. It's an Austrian Alexander Bain telegraph from 1883. And it actually makes a great sound. and was very, very well made. The wood and the metal and then the actual workings made it extra special. You can see the pencil 
and you had to remove the pencil in order to be able to open the dance card. In this case, I can show you inside, and it's very well done and shows the waltz and a polka, another waltz. They said that mainly that waltzes usually were at least a third of the dances because Strauss was so revered. This one is a Breguet style spring wound telegraph register from 1894. And you can see the 25th of January, 1894. Again, you can't open it until you take the pencil out. But this one actually has some moving parts to it. And is quite an intricate example of a spring wound telegraph register. And now we get to a wonderful example of a complete telegraph station including key, register, here's the galvanometer, and there's even bells. And it was very, very well constructed, even to the point of having a pencil that is held with a little ivory at the top. And when you open it up, it's quite a work of art. And this one, again, is from Budapest, so it gives the names of the sponsors and the dance. And it looks like someone wrote in maybe one person's name. Maybe they just did all the dances with one person. And as you can see, it, this was from Hungary and very, very well made up to the silk coverings and, and the pencil and all the ornate workings of that telegraph, even to the wheels. Everything is very incredible for that time, that time period and the workmanship that went into it. I wonder how much the woman was charged extra for this one. Well, these are some items that we are happy to share with you, and we hope you enjoy them. This concludes our virtual show and tell. We miss you all. We had so much fun sharing these items. We hope that you stay safe and well. Please take care of yourselves. Jim and I and the rest of the AWA crew all wish you the best. Please feel free to leave any comments or questions on YouTube. We look forward to hearing from you soon and seeing you next.